and taking his classes uh, so far. And before we move, let's give God and give thanks for Dr. Campbell for this week. Amen. Pastor Perkins, thank you. <clears throat> My voice gone this morning. All of the uh, Gateway uh, Seminary students, if you're here, raise your hand. Gateway, you need to uh, see Pastor Wilson, stand Pastor Wilson. You can get credit, uh, two, uh, two credits for this conference, but it's not going to come easy. <laughs> Uh, see uh, uh, Pastor Wilson after this uh, session so he can give you the particulars uh, so you can get your two units. Two units to help you. <laughs> Amen. I think they're electives, but uh, get those two units. See uh, Pastor uh, Wilson. Amen. God be praised. Amen. We're, we're grateful to have again with us Dr. Nathan Johnson, he's going to come and give us a sermonic solo, and the next verse voice we'll hear will be Dr. Arturo Azurdia, who will present the word to us on this morning. Let's receive Pastor Johnson at this time. A precious fountain and it's free to all a healing, a healing stream. And it flows from Calvary, Calvary's mountain, Jesus, Jesus, keep me the cross there is a precious a precious fountain and it's free to all A healing stream, and it flows from Calvary's, Calvary's mile, Calvary's mountain, and it's in the cross. Oh, in, in the cross, be my, be my, my, my glory, my glory. Till my, 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 my rapture 
glad my raptured soul one day shall find I'm gonna find rest beyond the river, the river, and it's in, in the cross, it's in, in the cross. soul one day shall find I'm gonna find rest I'm gonna find rest I'm gonna find rest I'm going to find rest. Anybody here, are you looking for rest? Rest, rest, rest. Are you looking for rest? Rest, rest, rest. One of these mornings, it won't be long. You're going to look for me, look for me, and I'll be gone. I'm going to find rest beyond the river. I wish I could say river like that. Just river. One time. God be with you, dear friends. Thank you for the privilege of uh, inviting me back again. I always look forward to this conference um, as a great honor for a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm very much committed to the theme of this conference. The word and its sufficiency. We can't hear enough of that today. And I'm going to talk with you a little bit about this later on. The second reason I come is because I have the greatest respect for Dr. Campbell, who is a man to be honored and regarded and respected and uh, esteemed and loved. And so whenever he gives me a call, um, if it's in any way possible for me to be here, it is my great privilege to do that. So I am thankful. Greetings from Portland, Oregon. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. 
but you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your way so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May you restore the joy to Zion and build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous and burnt offerings offered whole. Then bowls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of the Lord. I begin this way, my dear friends. Because when I finish this morning, I suspect that confession may be the order of the day. So in the light of that, would you please be so kind as to open your Bibles to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. Our Father and our God, we now draw near to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus. And on the basis of his merits, we ask you, please, to grant us the empowerment of your Spirit. We have just been reminded that we are so desperate for you, we must always ask you to keep us near the cross. And so it's on the basis of the cross that we come to you, not on our own merits, not on our own goodness, but to entirely rest our well-being upon your grace and mercy. And we ask you now, O Lord and God, to talk. May we get beyond the mannerisms, the idiosyncrasies, the voice, the vocabulary, the demeanor of a man. And may we hear from you. And we in turn promise, O Lord and God, to respond appropriately. We ask this in Jesus' name. Congregations are not always effective at communicating with the men who pastor them. Congregations are not always effective at communicating with the men who pastor them. Positive affirmations are frequently left unspoken. Harsh criticisms are typically whispered in secret. But if the ordinarily unspoken were to suddenly find a way of expressing itself openly in a corporate voice, this, I think, dear friends, is what a pastor would hear from a healthy congregation of mature Christians. We want you to be responsible for saying and acting among us what we believe about God and kingdom and gospel. 
we are going to ordain you to this ministry, and we want your vow that you will stick to it. This is not a temporary job assignment, but a way of life that we need lived out in our community. We know there will be days and months, maybe even years, when we won't feel like believing anything and won't want to hear it from you. It doesn't matter. Do it. There may be times when we come to you as a committee or delegation and demand that you tell us something other than what we are telling you now. Promise right now that you won't give in to what we demand from you. You are not the minister of our changing desires or our time-conditioned understanding of our needs or our secularized hopes for something better. With these vows of obedience, we are lashing you fast to the mast of the word so you will be unable to respond to the siren voices. Your task is to keep telling the basic story representing the presence of the Spirit, insisting on the priority of God, speaking the biblical words of command and promise and invitation. Now this, my dear friends, is what I not infrequently hear from pastorless congregations, even when they themselves cannot articulate it quite so definitively. Though our search committee has a stack of resumes a mile high from men who seem to be eager to do every other thing, do you know of someone who would be willing to spend his life faithfully bringing the word of God to us every Lord's day? So where are the men who wear the prophetic mantle? Where are the men who stand before the people of God and proclaim his word with a heaven-sent authority that bespeaks the very call of God? There are some right here in this room, many of you among them, and I rejoice because of you. It's the reason I now ask of you. Why does it seem, my dear brothers and sisters, that the prophetic mantle is going, growing closer and closer to extinction? While the corporate model, the therapeutic model, the social justice model have become the preferred options for men entering ministry. You say, well, Art, now with all due respect, you're a dinosaur. Haven't you been paying attention? The prophetic model is a style of ministry that is no longer relevant in our postmodern culture. But is this true? In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Now, does that sound like to you as if the Apostle Paul is setting this forth as one of several stylistic options for the Christian ministry? For a man called of God, appointed by God to be a spokesman for the word of God, to refuse to herald that word in an unambiguous and authoritative fashion can never be legitimized as a simple preference for a more relevant style. It is nothing less than a blatant expression of ministerial defiance. And more to the point this morning, it is to take your stand in the lineage of Jonah, son of Amittai, the only, divine, the, the only divinely appointed prophet who dared to defy God. There were others, of course, who hesitated. Some even questioned, but only Jonah defied. He is the most blatant personification of ministerial defiance in the entire Bible. But what do I mean by ministerial defiance. Not a cautious consideration. I need to take some time and consider the best way of going about this task. Not an occupational confusion. I'm not sure that I understand the nature of the assignment God has given to me. Not even a fearful trepidation. I'm scared to death of what will happen to me if I do this. Ministerial defiance, my dear friends, is none of these. So what is it? The answer to this question, 
vividly illustrated in these opening three verses comes in two parts. A presupposition and a repudiation. A presupposition and a repudiation. What is ministerial defiance? First of all, ministerial defiance presupposes an unambiguous commission from God. Ministerial defiance presupposes an unambiguous commission from God. In other words, if there is no commission from God, there can be no defiance. So that as we come now to this book, the book of Jonah, it doesn't begin with Jonah at all, but with something much better. The word of the one who began everything by his word. You say, well, you mean God. Yes, except this here says something more. Verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. It isn't just a reference, my friends, to the supreme being, the first principle of all things, the unmoved mover. Notice the capital letters, L-O-R-D. That's our English translator's way of saying to you, this refers not to God in general, but to God in particular, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who is the covenant partner with the nation of Israel, the great I am, Yahweh himself. It's a phrase, the word of the Lord, that appears nearly 250 times in the Old Testament. And whenever you come across it, sit up and take notice because it tells you something. Namely, that the man to whom it has come is not a self-made, self-called, self-sent minister speaking a message conjured up in his own mind. Rather, he bears the authenticating credentials of a true prophet. He has been made the recipient of the revelation of Yahweh. And in the case of Jonah, you understand, this isn't the first time. His surname, son of Amittai, identifies this Jonah as a man who has served God prior to this as a prophet in a ministry, by the way, that was very much pro-Israel. Jonah, son of Amittai, was a prophet to the northern kingdom during the reign of Jeroboam II, an exceedingly wicked and idolatrous king. And yet in 2 Kings 14, the Lord announces through Jonah that he intends to be gracious to his wayward bride, that under the military efforts of this very same Jeroboam, the enemies of Israel would be pushed back and her borders expanded to once again include the land that had belonged to her years before under the glorious golden era of King Solomon. You say, well, no doubt because the people of the northern kingdom had repented of their idolatry. Yeah, but that's precisely the point. They hadn't repented. Tough for the prosperity gospel people at this point. <laughs> Which means, you see, that though it was a day of unparalleled sin, it was simultaneously a day of unparalleled prosperity, something, my friends, that God often does to unrepentant people. He pours out his blessing upon them, not because of their repentance, but as an under, undeserved expression of his kindness with the intention that they recognize it in the light of their unworthiness to the end that melts them into repentance. Read Romans chapter 2. It's the kindness of God that moves you to repentance. And that's what occurs early in the ministry of Jonah, who, as you can imagine, becomes a very popular man in Israel, a prosperity prophet, as it were, on a national scale. He's everybody's favorite minister. He's invited to all the conferences. His face is on the cover of all the magazines. He's the hottest interview in town. And yet, for all of his celebrity... An anxiety is festering just underneath the surface of his conscience. Jonah knows the kind of God that Yahweh is, gracious and immeasurably so. He also knows that as an extension of God's holy love for his covenant partner, God is jealous. That one of God's names, Exodus 34, is jealous. And what Jonah knows, you see, is that for 150 years, God has been sending his prophets to Israel, denouncing their idolatry, urging them to repentance. But through it all, Israel has only become more stubborn in her sin, even in the face of God's increased blessings. And Jonah's theology is robust enough to understand God will not forever endure Israel's unfaithfulness. 
Then, one unsuspecting day, knock on the door. Special delivery telegram. The address, Jonas, son of Amittai, Gath Hefer in Galilee. The return address, Yahweh Elohim Shamaim, the Lord God of heaven. He slips the blade of the letter opener just underneath the flap of the envelope, slicing it open and reads in hurried rhythm, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. He recognizes exactly what it is. It's a commission. He's received commissions before. Here is a commission. Notice one that expresses great urgency. Go. Actually, in Hebrew, there are two verbs here that are both commands, imperatives. Arise, go. The idea is go right now. Go immediately. Go now. It's a commission, notice, also that acknowledges a significant reality. Go to the great city of Nineveh. Great in the sense of its size and significance. And also, perhaps, because of God's sovereign purposes for it in the not-too-distant future. Thirdly, it's a commission that assigns an awesome responsibility. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. It is a Hebrew verb that connotes disapproval and warning. Proclaim God's judgment upon it. The point, here is a commission without the slightest ambiguity. It's as clear as a bell. And yet there is something highly peculiar about it. Something that Jonah sniffs out immediately. I'm a prophet of Yahweh. In the tradition of Elijah and Elisha, I'm a contemporary of Hosea and Amos. I know my work. I know my calling. And the pattern has always been the same. Prophetic messages are always directed to the people of God. Now... God, of course, has given occasional messages to prophets concerning other nations, but never before has he sent a prophet into a foreign land for the purpose of delivering his word to them. This is altogether unprecedented. And as soon as he says it, the light goes on. Look at the very last phrase of verse 2. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because... Its wickedness has come up before me. It suggests a reckless racking up of offenses that the Lord can no longer abide. With that last phrase, my dear friend, does it in any way sound familiar to you? Because its wickedness has come up before me an echo of an earlier Old Testament story with which all of you are acquainted. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is immense, and their sin is extremely serious. I will go down to see if what they have done justifies the cry that has come up to me. So what does God do? Send in Abraham to preach about God's imminent judgment, calling the people to repentance? No. Why? In the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, God had come to the end of his mercy. No more sermons, no more opportunities, no possibility of repentance. The evil has come up before me, Abraham. Get Lot and run for cover. Here the language is eerily reminiscent. Nineveh is a city of great wickedness, notorious, by the way, in the ancient world for its brutality, its unrestrained cruelty and violence. Like a new and improved Sodom, the wickedness of Nineveh has come to my attention, Jonah. So just like Abraham before you, get out and make sure you shield your eyes while I blast it off the face of the earth. Right? Get up. Go there. And preach to them. Go to Nineveh. And preach? Why? Unless, perhaps, God's intended outcome for Nineveh is different than that of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, my dear friends, Jonah knows that the preaching of judgment over against the act of judgment implies the possibility of repentance. 
It is the means that God most often uses to affect the experience of salvation. My dear friends, you can trace this out in both Old Testament and New. I realize it may strike you as a bit strange to hear this, but the reason is owing to the fact that our reading of the Bible has been so conditioned by the lenses of our evangelical subculture, we now rarely see judgment anywhere in the Bible. Consequently, we preach it even less. And then we wonder why so few conversions... People say, well, gee, don't you believe in once saved, always saved? Well, I do believe in once saved, always saved. What I don't believe in is once prayed, always saved. The reality of imminent judgment is the only context in which salvation has any meaning. My friends, you do need to understand this. We say to people freely and warmly and lovingly, you need to be saved, my dear friend. But from what? A bummer of a life? An abusive marriage? A meaningless job? Living at poverty level? You need to be saved from the wrath to come. That for us is not an embarrassing reality to be hidden. It is a compelling rationale to be heralded. We are not world vision. We are not the United Way. We are not the American Red Cross. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for the work that they do. But we, we are the company of God's prophets called to do what no one else can do. Eternal salvation is our business. And my dear brothers and sisters, nothing but nothing must ever obscure this. As such, the Bible is unambiguous regarding the means to this end. God's methodology of choice is preaching. Preaching that faithfully declares the word of the Lord's judgment so as to achieve God's saving purpose in human beings. And after all, isn't this what Paul does when standing before the virtual postmoderns on Mars Hill? Listen. Since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Judgment is coming. You say, well, Art, of course, you know, that's the Apostle Paul. You know how he is, you know, misogynist, homophobe. I really prefer an approach that resembles the gospel. Well is right. <laughs> you mean like this? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Did I get it right? Not quite. The eternal life that is acquired by believing in the Son of God is defined by the contrast that it is set against. Listen again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Look that word up in your Bible programs, but instead have eternal life. The preaching of judgment is a means of grace. And knowing this as he does, Jonah is now brought face to face with the question of ultimate significance for every gospel minister. Who are you for? Who are you for? Called to preach a message that will prove offensive and in all likelihood arouse hostility against yourself. A message that could result in an outcome that is abhorrent to your every sensibility. An outcome that only sees the prosperity of your greatest enemies, but also sets the stage for a violent catastrophe to be poured out upon your own unrepentant people. Who are you for, Jonah? Who are you for? And my dear brother, well, in the words of our dear friend Robert Smith, Old Testament characters are not primarily models of morality. They are mirrors of identity. Who are 
you for your immediate family, your nation, your congregation, your denomination, your reputation, your ambition, your political preference, your convenience, your economic well-being. Who are you for, yourself or God? Because every now and again, the answer to this question will require a choice from you that is exclusive of all others. It reminds me of a scene from the life of Joshua. When he is brought face to face, you see, with this very same question. Just before the capture of Jericho, we come across a really strange account of Joshua's encounter with a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua, as the commander of Israel's army, asks, are you for us or for our enemies? The answer he receives turns his entire way of thinking inside out. Neither. I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. It is the angel of Yahweh, a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ. And Joshua, he's told to take off his sandals because he is standing on holy ground. He falls on his face in worship, you see, because he understands. He gets it. You don't ask God, who are you for? God asks you, who are you for? The Lord... The Lord isn't on Joshua's side. The Lord isn't on Israel's side. They must choose to be on the Lord's side. A choice, my dear brothers, that from time to time, in one way or another, will inevitably be set in front of you. Who are you for? It is the choice set before Jonah. What is ministerial defiance? It's a phenomenon predicated upon a presupposition, one that you've just observed right here. Ministerial defiance presupposes an unambiguous commission from God, which is exactly what Jonah received. But ministerial defiance is rooted in more than just a presupposition. Here now is the second part of the answer to this question, Ministerial defiance displays itself in a determined repudiation of God. Ministerial defiance displays itself in a determined repudiation of God. Look at this again. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But, which means we're in trouble already. In defiance of the crystal clear command in verse 2, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. God tells Jonah to get up and go to Nineveh to the northeast about 600 miles, a three-month trip in those days. Jonah's response, he gets up all right and in a hurry, but the direction is an outrageous repudiation. He travels down to Joppa and boards a ship heading southwest to Tarshish. Most scholars believe this to be a location in southern Spain, Thousands of miles away, estimated to be a trip that would take at least a year. But before I tease out this defiance a little bit more, I want you to think about something for a moment. Had Jonah a mind to determine the approval of God on the basis of favorable circumstances, he must have thought to himself at this point, look at all the open doors. He arrives at the port in Java, and lo and behold, a ship preparing to leave. And not just any ship, mind you, a Tarshish ship, as they were then called, the ancient equivalent of our long-distance ocean liners. And wonder of wonders, there just so happens to be an available cabin on this ship heading to the antithetical pole of the place to which he had been sent. But the clincher, you see, the clincher is when Jonah is told the price of the fare. No small amount for a trip that far, 
But as fortune would have it, Jonah has the right amount of money to book passage. Amazing, given the fact that he's on the run and hasn't had time to stop at the ATM. <laughs> now, I'm playing with you a bit, right? I'm exaggerating a bit for the sake of effect, but the point is clear. Everything, so it seems, has fallen into place perfect. So that if Jonah were the typical American evangelical living in the 21st century, he would no doubt say, God must be in this. His confirmation is on all of it. It really is amazing how we can discern the will of God to suit our own desires and our own sin. I really feel that God is telling me to do this. God is saying to me in my spirit that this is okay. Oh, I know it looks a bit weird, but look at all of these open doors. Like a pastor who justifies his own self-serving compromises by telling himself, well, you know, the, the church is growing. Giving has increased. There's a real spirit of unity within the congregation. Baptism numbers are up. My dear brothers, let me tell you something. If you compromise a clear-cut theological doctrine because holding to it might split your church, don't be surprised if your compromises are met with great success and approval. If you allow yourself to indulge in thoughts of a sexual affair, don't be surprised when an actual opportunity for adultery presents itself. You decide to run away from the Lord, don't be surprised when Satan provides you with every bit of transportation you need. If you have a heart to rebel against God, you can expect, dear friends, that the means to do so will find you. And tragically, defiance always takes you further than you ever imagined you would go, and it takes you there faster than you ever thought it would. Once Jonah has become determined in, its, in his defiance, it becomes so easy for him to express it in practical ways. Everything fails. But that said, my friends, now what is his end game in all of this? What is his intention, his aim, his plan? Well, did you notice that verse 3 is framed at its beginning and its end with the phrase, from the Lord. Look at it. The beginning of verse 3, but Jonah ran away from the Lord. Look at the last part of verse 3. He went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Actually, the Hebrew reads, from the presence of the Lord, right? But Jonah ran away from the presence of the Lord. End of the verse. He sailed for Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord. You say, but Art, come on now, he can't do that, it's impossible. Trying to get away from God is like trying to get away from air. In him we live and move and have our being. Well, my friends, Jonah knows this. He's as orthodox as you are. He doesn't need Logos to tell him this. He knows that God is everywhere present with the totality of his being. In just a few verses, he will give testimony to this very thing. He's not entertaining the possibility of eluding God's omnipresence. You remember Elijah? His repeated claim? I stand in the presence of the Lord. It's how the angel identified himself to the father of John the Baptist. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. It is a Hebrew idiom, this. Used to speak of being in the Lord's service, ready, willing, and present to do his bidding. So when you read at the end of both verses, uh, uh, both, uh, both ends of this verse, that Jonah is fleeing from the presence of the Lord, you're not to believe that he's actually attempting to escape God's presence you're to understand this as his refusal to function in God's service. It's no less obvious than were Jonah to say openly, I refuse. I will not do it. You can get Hosea. You can get Amos. You can get whoever you jolly well please, God, but you will not have me. And to enhance this same tone of defiance, 
Notice that the storyteller mentions not once, not twice, but three times in the Hebrew of this single verse. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for Tarshish. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish. What does the writer think? We're stupid. Hard of hearing, maybe? No, he's calling your attention to Jonah's defiance. God called Jonah to Nineveh. Jonah left for Tarshish. 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 It's up in your face. So that you understand that there is no confusion here on the part of Jonah. No misunderstanding. No twinge of hesitation. This is white-knuckled, lock-jawed, bull-headed defiance illustrated geographically. Not Nineveh. Tarshish. Imagine that the word of the Lord comes to an American living in New York City telling him to go east to Iraq to preach to the members of Al-Qaeda. And instead, he immediately goes west to San Francisco and boards a boat headed for Hong Kong. (laughs) It is the visible trajectory of a heart's refusal to obey the word of the Lord. It is Jonah's determined repudiation of God himself. It is ministerial defiance. I know what God wants. His word is clear. And the answer is no. You say, but why? Why does he refuse so demonstrably? And someone might say, well, you know, because Jonah doesn't want God to be merciful to the Assyrians in the event that they repent. Yes, yes, yes. But why doesn't Jonah want God to be merciful to the Assyrians in the event that they repent? You say, Art, because Jonah is a first-class bigot, and you are almost right, but not entirely right. You're close, but you're not close enough. The answer, you see, is tied directly to Jonah's latent anxieties about Israel's refusal to repent of her sin. What will be the outcome for us If God blesses repentant Assyria and we continue on in our unrepentant idolatry. In other words, Isaiah is a very big stick. You know the trajectory of the Old Testament storyline. You know what happens in 722 B.C. Assyria becomes God's tool of chastisement, taking Israel into captivity. And Jonah's not inexperienced. He can see what's on the horizon. And so the question then for Jonah is not hypothetical or theoretical. It is concrete and it is immediate. Who are you for? Are you a patriot or are you a prophet? Because you can't be both. Are you a patriot or a prophet? Are you for the people of God? Or are you for God? You need to be very wary of thinking that somehow you love the people of God more than God does. In the case of Jonah, here's what tells the tale. Tarshish. Tarshish. He is a called minister who knows God's will but refuses because he fears the outcome of being faithful to God. Have you refused for similar reasons? It is, my dear friends, a manifestation of ministerial defiance. You know what's lingering in my mind? As I was putting all of this together, I thought about this conference three or four years ago. I got up to speak, and throughout the majority of my sermon, one particular man stood to his feet and shouted repeatedly, Preach, watchman! Preach, watchman! Watchman, preach! 
And of course, he was referring to the words of Yahweh spoken to another prophet, Ezekiel. Listen. If the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that person will be taken because of their sin, but I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. <laughs> Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sins, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. You understand, my dear friends, this is exactly what Paul says to the elders from the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. One wonders, my friends, if this ought to be the very thing we preach at the ordination of a new pastor, that he will be held accountable for heralding a message that if embraced would save a person from judgment. Because as you well know, Jonah is not the last minister to defy God, is he? The famous Scottish preacher Alexander White once said, when I watch the workings of my own heart, this is what I am compelled to write. I am the It is a warning, Jonah is, to all ministers tempted to forsake a prophetic one for the sake of protecting a corporate one. Shading the truth, altering the truth, nuancing the truth, muting the truth so that it doesn't jeopardize the admiration of the people, the size of the church, or the amount of money given. I mean, Art, if I preach the doctrine of election from Ephesians chapter 1, the people won't give. If I preach the practice of church discipline from Matthew 18, the congregation won't grow. If I define marriage as Jesus is, the people will leave. And so if I preach the coming judgment of God, you might as well start looking for my successor. But my dear friends, I want to tell you something. You are a servant of God's people, but they are not your boss. The Apostle Paul in Galatians says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? Listen, listen to this, friends. If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now, those are antithetical positions, and you've got to make up your mind which side you're going to be on. Who are you for? Because if you were not for God and his revealed word as the final word, there is every reason to expect that 500 years from now there will once again be the need for another reformation. The professing believers of the Bible will lose the Bible once again. It is still the formal principle, friends, sola scriptura. It's why Dr. Campbell has these conferences year after year after year, because this is still the issue at stake. It's still the issue at risk. It is still the issue in the vulnerable place, not now because of the Catholic magisterium, but because of Protestant ministers who have determined not to say what God has given us to say. You are not counselors. You are not administrators. You are not corporate heads. Allow me to disabuse you from that huge misdirection. If you are a pastor, then first and foremost, you've been called to be a spokesman for the living God, a ministry to be sure that is fraught with inevitable and inescapable difficulties because of one, the opposition you will face both inside and outside the community of faith, and two, the demanding nature of proclaiming divine mercy to people who are so profoundly undeserving. It is not an easy thing, beloved, is it? To lovingly proclaim God's free grace to the people who are naturally repellent to you. Whether it be the Muslim extremist, the flamboyant homosexual, the self-righteous legalist, or the alt-right bigot, but whatever the context, to refuse to proclaim the word of the Lord for any reason 
is to willfully engage in a determined display of ministerial defiance. Are you willing? You don't need to answer that for me. And you know what? I'm right in there with you. Because I can delay with the best of them now. I can hesitate. I can excuse. I can wait around ostensibly for the right moment to arrive. When the congregation has matured just a bit more, when it's likely to affect the least amount of fallout. Now, friends, I do understand the wisdom that calls us to communicate the truth in a timely manner, right? Apples of gold in settings of silver and all that Proverbs tells us. I understand all of that. What I also understand is my own powers of self-deception are such I can deftly employ the notion of timeliness to conveniently serve as a redefinition of defiance. What is ministerial defiance? A reality consisting of two principal ingredients. It presupposes an unambiguous commission from God, and it displays itself in a determined repudiation of God. And so, if you would allow me, speaking for the entire company of men and women at the Word Conference, all of us, I suspect, are drawn in one way or another, we are defiant ministers. All of us, with the exception of the one greater than the other. The greater Galilean prophet in whom there was never the slightest defiance. His commission, too, was unambiguous. He was the chosen one given the assignment of dying on a cross as the satisfaction for the sins of a world that was utterly repellent to his holiness. Never even for a moment did he ever turn in the opposite direction, never despite the brutal opposition that he faced from those inside and outside the community of faith, never ever once did he move in a Tarshish-like direction because his stubborn determination was always Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Never once was there any question about who he was for. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Which was what? To redeem all of us who have fled from the word of the Lord. To purge us from the guilt of our defiance. The defiance of every Jonah-like minister who has foolishly tried to refuse God's commission and ultimately failed. You were Jonah. And I am Jonah. But our defiance of the declared word is expunged by the obedience of the incarnate word. Who having been raised from the dead has now come to pursue you. And to call out to you. We are all Jonah. But one greater than among us. So here's the question. Who are you for? Are you a patriot or a prophet? Are you for the people of God? Or are you Our Father and our God, it always is the old, old story. Your word always ultimately brings us to Jesus. Because just like Jonah, who really is not a model of morality, but a mirror of identity, has caused us to see ourselves and our failings. We want to build a big church more than we want to be faithful to you. 
and we can build a big church if you decide that you can you want your word truncate your word nip and tuck here and there avoiding the things that are controversial avoiding the things that would drive people away But, Father, we remember the Lord Jesus saying that the gospel would divide people. Parents from their children, spouses from each other. The gospel brings with it a sword. And it doesn't help your saving purpose. When we trim the truth, to keep people happy with us and in the church. So Lord and God, I pray, be with my dear brothers and sisters in their Sunday school classes, in their counseling, in their discipling, for these brothers who are responsible to preach and lead congregations. I pray and ask, O Lord and God, that while they maintain their love and winsomeness and joy and affection and love, they would never, ever trim that tree. I ask you this, Father, on behalf of these dear men and women and for my own sake as well. Would you hear our confession in this regard?